Test, 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 one, two, one, two, one, two. This is a quick overview of airway management that goes with CPAP that's being used in the Denver metro area. Hopefully it kind of goes over a little bit of everything. Uh, most stuff you should already know, but this will be a good review if you haven't used this particular thing or just want some review on uh, some of the procedures that we're going to be doing along with this or what it can be used for. Uh, like I mentioned before, this is going to go over things that uh, we can use the CPAP for, congestive heart failure, COPD, asthma, uh, other things, and then uh, the tools that you need to use in conjunction with it, and then tools that you need to use and be aware of that you may need after the fact. This is not an all-inclusive uh, respiratory emergency type of training. These are just going to go over the, the core competencies that we see all the time. Congestive heart failure, COPD, um, <clears throat> ARDS, and then asthma. And these are pretty common that we're going to see in the field on a, pretty much on a daily basis or on a pretty regular basis, I should say. Congestive heart failure is something that we run into pretty commonly, um, and this is one that we use the CPAP a lot with. Now, these are signs and symptoms that you're going to come into contact with on a regular basis. Crackles, rails, but you need to think about other things, uh, how your patient is presenting. If they have nocturnal dyspnea, if they have a cough, um, if they have acute hypertension, um, you know, look at the 12 lead, do the 12 lead in conjunction with their treatment with their known history. When we look at these people that are hypoxic, what we're looking at is two different things. Uh, when you add supplemental oxygen, are they still under 90? Um, you need to also look at this as uh, patients that are chronically on oxygen, when they're on two to three liters, they're hypoxic. You raise that up and they're still hypoxic. Uh, a lot of times when we do our, our 12 leads, we're going to rule out for an MI, see if they're having an acute episode or if they're having like strain patterns or tall widening QRS that would show that there's something um, that's going to be there that's actually causing uh, a great or worsening of the problem. Not only do these patients need a 12 lead and O2, um, we're also going to be looking at nitro. We want to get that pressure down and start getting that fluid pull back out. Um, and a lot of times these patients actually present with uh, wheezing or what's called cardiac asthma. So a lot of times, um, even though they're not moving enough air to where you can actually hear whether or not they've got rails or crackles, um, when the airway is constricted, if nitros or uh, if uh, albuterol is given, you open up the airways, you may find out that it's actually CHF more than asthma, which is what you originally thought that that was going to be. But with the O2 and then the CPAP also giving that positive pressure and helping them be able to get the O2 into their system, uh, always remember that there's a possibility that you're going to have to further help these patients. BVM, possible nasal innovation um, and oral innovation if they become uh, unresponsive with the CPAP. COPD is uh, our next um, disease process that we have in the line. Um, that's usually one that your patients know of right away um, because that's something that's a, an ongoing long-term disease. Uh, what it does is it's actually emphysema, asthma, chronic bronchitis, these chronic respiratory, uh, respiratory illnesses that they've had for the majority of their life that are causing further issues now. If you've ever heard the term uh, pink puffer or blue bloater, these are the chronic bronchitis and the emphysemas. Um, some of these, like your emphysema patients or the pink puffers, the ones that are always trying to purse their lips and kind of keep that residual peep up in their lungs. Uh, blue bloaters are usually barrel chested. They're the ones that are also um, chronically in a uh, cyanotic state. Um, and these guys, the, they both have the same types of COPD respiratory issues just brought on by different um mechanisms. And many of us know that these uh, COPD patients have a lot of phlegm, um, usually mucus that they're coughing up on a regular basis, and that inside their lungs they've actually had a broken down of the uh, alveoli walls and they're actually blebs and they actually were able to air trap quite a bit. So we need to be very careful because of this air trapping. 
Remember, COPD is a chronic disease that, while uh, may not have been very bad when the patient was first diagnosed, is always going to progress into worse and worse stages. So remember that just because your patient wasn't on oxygen poor, they may need to be um, on supplemental oxygen as the course goes on. And you may be seeing these acute patients that weren't acute before, but they are, even though it's just a progression of the disease. These are the patients that have the uh, coarse cough, usually really thick mucus. Um, usually it's productive, very thick mucus, um, one to two word dyspnea. They may actually only be able to talk one to two word sentences all the time. So this is also another place where you need to look at what their normal is and how they're presenting to you. Are they chronically on oxygen? Is it not doing the job anymore? Are they chronically only able to speak one to two words? Are they talking full sentences? Look at your uh, cabinography. All of these respiratory patients should always be on cabinography. Um, that's really where you're going to get the idea of what their respiratory effort is. Again, with this type of respiratory patient, we want to make sure that we've ruled out that there's not any cardiac issues, and that's why we're doing the 12 lead. If your patient is not in a critical situation where you can't get past your airway and, and you're breathing. Um, O2, supplemental O2, start treating them with the steroids. These people are usually on steroids, on albuterol, on Atrovet. Um, CPAP is also a good one. You just need to make sure that you're watching them because they are also one of these people that need to be coached on their breathing because um, they're already air trapping. So if we're not doing other things besides the CPAP, um, there's a very good chance that we can cause other types of barotrauma. So make sure that you're treating them not just one thing but with the whole gamut of anything that you can get to them. Um, VVM is also something if they're not able to use the CPAP and know that there's a very good chance that these patients are going to go down to the point where you're going to need to orally intubate them. PE is one that we need to associate more commonly with lifestyle, um, just like COPD, but um, what are their risk factors? A lot of times we get patients that have been in bed with long bone fractures, um, say they've had a hip fracture and now they're getting up and being ambulatory in the rehab facility, postpartum, um, that whole uh, blood barrier has been breached a lot of times they'll have amniotic fluid that actually becomes uh, an embolus fat embolus air embolus there there are many different types of embolus not just clots but if we look at our patient then we can better determine if they're actually at risk when we're discussing the mismatch is um, all the signs and symptoms aren't, aren't adding up the way you would think that they would. So they have shortness of breath and a lot of times these people are epoxic with very, very low uh, SAO2. But when you listen to their breath sounds, they have clear, equal breath sounds. They have pinpoint chest pain and that's what throws everybody off is, hey, they're clear. They shouldn't have uh, a low SAO2, some like CHF or COPD where you're going to have diminished to absent breath sounds. And that's how we know that that's very indicative of a PE is because the inside of the lung is not actually what's being affected. It's more in the circulatory system. So that's how we can differentiate these. This is also where we're looking at our 12 lead with our S wave in one, Q in three, and then our T in three. Uh, S1, Q3, T3 is very indicative of a PE. Now, it's not always going to be present, um, so you may get two of the three signs. 12 leads aren't always going to be 100% all the time on everything, but it's definitely something to look at if you're already trying to narrow in on one thing. While treatment here looks like it's very minimal for something this bad, it's because the ultimate goal is this patient absolutely needs thrombolytics. Um, these people, like with the saddle PE, uh, have a very high mortality rate. So this is something where we support the patient and rapidly transport them as fast as we can because there's not a lot of treatments that we can do in the field. ARTS is not a syndrome that we usually come in contact in the pre-hospital setting um, or even doing interfacility transports because these patients are usually in the ICU. Uh, they've had respiratory issues for a long time. Um, they've been septic aspirations. Um, but we may see them on the other side where they've had a history of ARTS. They're coming back out to go back to a rehab facility. And so we need to understand their history, what's caused it, and the possibility that they could still be having other respiratory issues with that and need support that way.
like I said before, a lot of these patients have been on uh, ventilators uh, in the ICU for a long period of time. Even if they've been weaned off, they've probably still been bed confined. So we need to understand that when we start moving them around, they may start having respiratory complications, um, either mucus plugs or, or other debris that's in their lungs um, and not tolerate the transport well. And we need to be ready for suction or many other things. A lot of times these patients may even be trach patients also. So they're going to need a lot more support in the transport um, than a normal patient would. If you do run into these patients in the field, they probably will be on a ventilator. Um, sometimes uh, those vent patients can be moved uh, to other LTACs and stuff like that. Um, maintain their uh, oxygenation levels where where they normally are, you know, mid to, to low 90s. Also, they actually need a decreased tidal volume, 6 to 8 liters um per kilogram and that's normal uh or ideal body weight so whenever you see somebody that's a, a ideal body weight even if they're obese um you need to look at if they're five four what they would normally do because their lungs are at, still at the same capacity uh and actually if you titrate that volume down a little bit from there but that is this is at the normal the body size of somebody, however tall they are. They also use incredibly high PEEP, uh, 15, and usually that's to get through that fluid barrier and make sure that you're getting oxygenation into the vascular system. And limit fluids, just like your CHF patients, you want to limit the amount of fluids going in because you're already having problems with ventilation through fluid that's already existing. Asthma is a really... Uh, pretty common. This actually is usually juvenile onset. A lot of times our patients have their medications with them. Um, they know what their limitations are, what sets them off. Uh, allergy seasons that are bad or exercise induced, uh, you know, um, sometimes we'll also see some other things. The occupational asthma is something that's triggered. Uh, you need to think about these people when we're walking into certain uh, situations where they may have had an exposure or something like that. This is a really good demonstration of uh, kind of going back to the COPD of how asthmatic airways are actually always inflamed. They're not like a normal airway where they're always uh, relaxed. So a lot of times, even before they're actually having an asthma attack, they are constricted. And so they still are going to have other issues with mucus plugs and air trapping that normal people wouldn't just because they do have a narrowing airway. This is that uh, capnography waveform that's indicative of asthma patients where it's the finning. And what that is is the, the harder exhalation um, where they're trying to get as much of the, the remaining air from the air trapping out as possible. Your capnography goes up from there because of the air trapping. They're actually uh, pockets of the CO2 are building up and then they're forcefully exhaling. Um, and that's why we have that prolonged expiratory pattern. And also the shark finning is because they're forcefully trying to get the rest of that air out. These are people that um, usually if you've gotten a hold of them, they've already used their albuterol. We need to start doing things like uh, getting to Atrovent, steroids, Epi. Um, the reason magnesium is so far down on the list is in some services, it's actually considered a call-in order. Um, we want you to be able to manage that airway as soon as possible. Uh, CPAP is actually proven to be beneficial, and a lot of the CPAPs that are out there now are able to let you do an inline neb so that you can still treat these patients with the albuterol, the atrovent, and the O2 while they're getting the supplemental uh, oxygen through the CPAP. Uh, always prepare for advanced airway. A lot of times when you question your patient, ask them if they've ever been innovated before. Uh, many of these patients know that they've been innovated and they know how bad it, it can be and they can tell you what their status is. Now we're kind of getting into the point where these are the tools tricks of the trade that we're going to use to treat all these respiratory patients. Um, capnography honestly needs to be used with everybody, cardiac, respiratory, and then we've got our CPAP. And then always remember that you need to go onto your advanced airways. There's no stopping until you get to the hospital. So um, just remember there's always a progression. Capnography is always required in any of your respiratory and cardiac patients, uh, especially if they have an advanced airway. Um, capnography has been proven to show uh, whether or not they have actually have uh, an airway status or not, uh, whether or not you've lost the airway, uh, especially intubated patients. This is kind of a fail-safe to make sure that you know the status of your patient. 
be familiar with uh, what capnography your particular service uses. Uh, there's inline filters that can be used with uh, intubated patients so that you know whether or not that tube is good. These also need to be on all ventilated patients because this is actually how you measure the status of your patient of whether or not they actually have good um, tidal volume and whether or not their respiratory rate is sufficient. Um, also we have uh, the cannulas that can be used underneath the CPAP mask. Um, these actually need to be used with the CPAP, not the inline because the inline on the capnography is a, a one-way valve and they will not work, but the cannulas do fit very well under the CPAP mask. CPAP is very uh, similar and usually prints out the same way as your ECG. So this is a 15 second strip. That means that they're actually breathing at 16 times a minute. Um, a lot of the capnography units will actually give you a respiratory status. That way you know if your patient's tachypnic or not. Um, your normal is 35 to 45. Um, being low means that you're alkalotic versus being too high means that you're actually in a respiratory acidosis. Several different causes for that. One of the reasons that I state that this is an overall good tool to use in every aspect is because if you look at this, um, we can actually show me metabolically whether or not they're in an acidosis or an alkalosis. We know other things that are going on. Respiratory system status, COPD patients that maybe have a blocked CHF patients where they have so much flu they don't have a good gas exchange. And then the same thing with those uh, PEs where there's basically you've shut down one part of the lung because there's an embolus causing no circulation. Um, so many different things that you can see for status with the respiratory and circulatory system. Uh, to help improve your patient's outcome. Uh, like we said before, this is this is a really good way to determine what the status of your patient is. A lot of times you can start seeing uh, respiratory issues start to come into play long before they are. Uh, you're going to start seeing some of that shark finning where maybe you're not hearing a wheezing or anything like that. Some of these chronic asthma patients actually are in a state of um, a reactive airway all the time so a lot of times you can catch a lot of things very early on uh, if you are also working with somebody that's tachypneic they're breathing really fast we know that they're hyperventilating or hypoventilating if they're too slow we can always uh, increase and decrease rates like with your ventilators to actually determine respiratory status and keep them in a comfortable level uh, CPAP is one of the best inventions that we've gotten in EMS in a long time. A lot of patients used to have to be nasally intubated, and a lot of times these patients were not actually coming back off the ventilators or being extubated in the hospital because uh, of their already decreased respiratory status. Uh, if we think back to gas law and also just your basic um, metabolism, things go from a higher concentration to a lower concentration. One thing that we've tried to do with this with CPAP is not only do we have an increased oxygen concentration, but we also have increased pressure because there's a bigger barrier to get across. So with the pressure, usually 5, 10, or 15 uh, uh, centimeters of water, it increases the uh, counteractive effects of CHF, COPD, and it helps also get that oxygen into the vascular system and through whatever barriers in the way. Now, this is also a very difficult procedure uh, for the patient. One thing to explain to them is make sure that they understand the procedure and why it's there. Some patients may have already had this or not. Think about the fact that you're putting something over their face. They're already having problems breathing. That's like you're normally standing there and I'm trying to put a pillow over your face. You're going to refuse it because you know you can't breathe through it. These patients are agitated. Um, they need to be coached, move slowly help them and include them in the treatment. Um, that's the best thing that I can tell you to do is, is coaching is everything on these patients. They need the treatment. They need to understand the treatment. We can't be too aggressive with this. They're already in a fight or flight status. Many, many airways are out there anymore. Uh, a lot of uh, agencies use different LMAs or the King Airways. Um, a lot of agencies are using ET tubes still. Uh, many have actually gone to a rescue airway as a primary airway just because it's more fail safe than the innovation with a, an ET tube. So know your local protocols. Uh, LMA and LMA Supreme are fairly common, used in a lot of operating rooms. Um, 
and used on a great number of patients. Uh, they're pretty fail safe that once they've been used properly, inserted, and they're sitting in the right position, inflated to the right cuff, they actually protect the area fairly well. A lot of them come with the option of having an MG placed, which is never a bad idea to make sure that there's not any type of aspiration ever. Uh, King airway is also uh, a blind insertion uh, airway above ET tube, uh, protects the airway fairly well with two balloons, um, one cuff versus the old combi tubes that had two different cuffs and a lot of different ways to uh, intubate the patient. Um, these are fair, uh, used in a lot of different systems uh, and a lot of different providers from the EMT all the way up through the paramedic are able to use these. While many paramedics pride themselves on their intubation skills, and uh, many of them will tell you they can intubate even if they haven't actually done an airway in, in a great number of months, uh, this is one of those that you need to practice often. You need to be familiar. Uh, once you've learned the muscle movement from school, you need to actually keep practicing. Um, there's a reason that in a lot of the systems that they're required to have so many intubations. Um, flights are required intubations on a quarterly basis. RSI, usually they go into the OR. So this is something you need to take into your own practice, get a hold of mannequins, make sure that you're um, teaching and learning the right way. That's the other big thing is when you're practicing, make sure you're practicing proper technique because if you're practicing in proper technique, you're just going to reinforce improper practice. So we're going to introduce the orangescope into the mouth just like normal and trying to find epiglottis and you're trying to get the best view of the glottis you could find. But even if you could just find epiglottis, you will be able to intubate this patient. That's a Cormac Lehane grade three view. Once you find epiglottis, what you're going to do is you're just going to ride the epiglottis with your bougie. So you're just going along the underside of the epiglottis with your bougie. And if you're doing that, you will enter glottis and you will be in the trachea. And that's the key. Now, how do you know you're in? Well, there's two ways that are described. The first one is you could actually feel the tracheal rings and you'll feel the tip of that bougie, that coup de tip rubbing against the tracheal rings. For me, uh, sometimes I feel it, sometimes I don't. What I keep doing is I keep pushing the bougie forward very gently, and eventually, if you're in the tracheal bronchial tree, you'll get hold up. Either you'll hit the carina or one of the branches of the main stem bronchi, and the bougie won't go any further. It'll stop at about 40 centimeters. If you're in the esophagus, on the other hand, it'll keep going. You could place that thing all the way to its hilt. So that's how you know. And once you've confirmed by hold up that point of the bougie stopping, you just withdraw until you're at about 25 and then you'll put the tube onto the bougie. Now for this, you really want a partner. Um, it's really tough to do yourself because one of the key mistakes that's made is uh, taking the laryngoscope out of the mouth. You want to leave the laryngoscope in the mouth to keep those posterior pharyngeal structures from collapsing on your bougie. So you have an assistant place the tube over the bougie, hold the top of the bougie, and this now allows you to advance the endotracheal tube through the cords. Just given the shape of the endotracheal tube, oftentimes it'll hold up on um, some of the cartilage or it'll just get caught on the cords. What you wanna do is just rotate the tube counterclockwise 90 degrees and then gently go back and forth and rotate ever so slightly and eventually tube will pass. As long as you're gentle, you're not gonna cause any airway trauma. If you try to jam this thing in, that's when you run into problems. So eventually the tube will start passing. You go into about 22 or 23 take out your laryngoscope, you take out your bougie, and you confirm your endotracheal tube. And this being the last of our slides is the crike. Uh, some use either a quick trach or a needle crike system or even a surgical trach where you're actually making a 
uh, insertion with a scalpel and putting an ET tube in place. This is kind of the last ditch effort to get an airway. Um, many times you see this coming out, well, your trached patients are basically, this is what's happened to them where they've gone into the OR and they've actually made a, a supplemental airway for patients that are on a vent for a long period of time. Uh, we see these in trauma patients. We see these in our um, airway patients that we're unable to get an intubated patient where we have that um, anaphylaxis or some other type of injury in the upper airway where we're not able to obtain that ET tube or the LMA can't maintain. So this is a last ditch effort, but it, it's kind of in the chain where we need to understand it and we need to practice it because there is that chance that you're going to use it. This is kind of a quick overview of CPAP, some of the reasons that we use CPAP, um, airway adjuncts that we're going to need after CPAP, and then the uh, capnography and other tools that we need to use with these patients. Um, pretty basic as far as the CHF, COPD. These are respiratory patients that are going to do very well our CPAP, not, uh, CPAP and capnography. Um, always know that there's a possibility that you're going to have to go to advanced airways. Practice, become familiar with all these things that we have. Use these tools as much as you can. It'll do great things for your patient.